Hi, and welcome to this new Smart Academy session. So today I'm very, very happy to be with Chris Marquez. Hi, Chris. Hi, everyone. Hi, Francis. How are you doing? Uh, fine, fine, very fine. So it's already the end of the week, but uh, I'm sure today's session will be super great. So I'm a bit stressed because there will be some special challenge for me a bit later, uh, but it will be all fine and I'm very happy to welcome you here. So let me quickly introduce Chris because he has like a unusual curriculum vitae. So for example, in 2004, he used to be the world champion of salsa dancing. Uh, and during the same year, he won the British national competition, the European competition and the world competition. That was 16 years ago. But we are not going to talk about this today. Uh, and we are more going to focus on the more recent history of Chris. And we met first time with Chris five years ago. And uh, I, I made him a demo of uh, SMUD with the rental company Alabama and uh, he, he discovered the tool at that time and very quickly understood the interest he could have in using it and uh, Chris was uh, the artistic director of Dancing with the Stars, the TV show, a big big TV show in France and he immediately see the, saw the potential and also what he could do with this for tours because he was living more and more with big tours and he will explain all of this to us and uh, very quickly understood the interest. And also just to mention, Chris is following the Smod Academy very carefully. And he also, beyond his talents of video art director, is also a real smother, uh, uh, which know how to go into the tool and use it. Yeah, I don't do shaders yet though. <laughs> yeah, no shaders yet, uh, of course, but uh, he knows a lot about Smod. Uh, but most of the time he's not the one using it, but uh, at least he, he understands smothers very well. And uh, he has really the right vision of everything from the very technical side to the very artistic side. And that's why uh, I believe it was very important to have him with us to do a session. So let's start it immediately. Welcome Chris and let's start. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'm really excited to be uh, here because uh, I love SMUD. I really kind of like discovered the tool in 2015. Uh, and uh, one of the biggest things is for me, a tool has to really kind of make my life and my job much, much easier. And uh, when you're a creative director, creative producer, tour director, there are very, very few tools that you actually, A, can actually interact with very easily, uh, B, that can actually follow the process right from the beginning to the end. And SMUD for me was really a revelation when I actually started working with it. Um, I'm going to start from the beginning uh, to explain a little bit why I kind of got to use SMOD and why I think it's kind of a quite an amazing end-to-end -end environment to work in. Um, as Francis mentioned, I'm the I was the creative producer and director of Dancing with the Stars in France, uh, which uh, is a format that you know is one of the biggest formats in the world. Um, and um, one of the interesting things, it's a format that is very kind of it localizes itself a lot. So, you know, the French format looks one way, the American a slightly different way. And um, you've got to kind of remain competitive. You've got to remain creative. And uh, the French market is uh, in a sense quite special uh, because we tend to kind of, as viewers, get bored very quickly. So we have to kind of innovate as much as possible and we have to move very, very quickly. So uh, on Dancing with the Stars, for example, and I think we've got some images uh, from the show, um, you know, we kind of introduced very quickly kind of like uh, things that went done on television. Uh, so, for example, you know, we would actually work a lot uh, with projection mapping. Now, although we were actually only projecting on the flat dance floor, one of the interesting things is we started working with the perspectives of the cameras to actually give kind of depth and 3D effects uh, to those projections. And uh, that's something that up to now, done you know and that was actually in 2011 2012 uh for dancing with the stars so what we see in there is um star 80 basil we need to go back to maybe dancing with the stars dance avec les stars <laughs> that is uh, that is sabrina following boys in stars of the 80s <laughs> we will see we will run after uh so, 
So the, uh, the interesting thing was, you know, year one, Dancing with the Stars 2011 was quite a standard show, you know, lights, a few kind of screens, and that was it. Uh, year two and three, we suddenly started kind of projecting and working with like three stuff like that. Uh, and then suddenly we started introducing other things, uh, such as, uh, for example, uh, using 3D graphics with an alpha layer that was actually uh, shown and composed in real time with the live screen uh, and the live feedback to kind of like create elements that actually went there. Today, we, we, we would be talking about probably like, um, um, yeah, like, you know, rendering in real time. And, you know, they talk about augmented reality, but it really wasn't. At the time, we're kind of just finding little tricks, which were, you know, doing the right things at the right time. In this sequence, for example, uh, we uh, just had graphics and we recreated the set in 3D and we basically mapped uh, those graphics all around the LED screens in real time with uh, the special effects that were the fireworks and stuff like that. Um, Dancing with the Stars, very creative, but one thing that is very different to any other show, we've got very big teams, we can do an awful lot of things. Um, so in this example, for example, we've got projection on the floor, but we've got actually 3D model that's actually on a kind of alpha layer transparent. And basically the mix of the two makes the Taj Mahal appear. Now, all those innovations are really cool, but when you want to kind of like do, do the same thing on other shows, it becomes more complex because most shows don't have as many people working as Dancing with the Stars, don't have the technical kind of like um, infrastructure that we have on Dancing with the Stars. And that was always kind of like, in a way, when we were moving away from this show, quite limiting, because we could do amazing, thing, amazing things on this show, but the second we would go somewhere else, it was a lot more complicated. Now, that was starting to bother me because I was like, there's no way, there's got to be a better way than just turning up on the day and actually assembling all the different kind of elements together, uh, all the CGI and, you know, all the special effects that we would want to do. And that's something on Dancing with the Stars we end up doing a lot. We turn up on the day and we assemble, and that takes an awful lot of time. So um, I, um, I then actually started doing an awful lot of concerts as well, and that's when I moved on to Star 80, Star, Star, Stars of the 80s. Uh, Stars of the 80s is basically a very popular show in France. It kind of fills arenas and stadiums. Uh, and uh, I started in 2015. Uh, with this show, and we were at the Stade de France with like 50,000 people in the audience. Now, I was given about four weeks to kind of like uh, create artistically this show. Now, you can imagine that, A, it's not a long time, it works very quickly. But again, the biggest problem is this last minute assembly. Constantly, we have the ideas, we kind of create pieces of media on one side, we kind of like want to treat some like you know footage on the other and we have all these ideas but again until the last minute we cannot actually assemble them until we're on site now i remember for example knowing that um you know this show was on a saturday evening live on television on tf1 and uh, on thursday night at midnight i am given the stadium to stop working so not only have i got to kind of like get on with the, all the lighting of the show with the team. Uh, but on top of that, we've got to kind of go, okay, as what we had in our heads kind of like, you know, worked out or not. And this model of working very last minute because of budget constraints is kind of becoming the norm, you know, wherever I, I think all of you kind of have the same experience, you know, do more in much, much, much less time. So after this stadium show, the producers approached me and said, look, We'd love for you to kind of like take care of our tour, uh, our arena tour and Zenith tour. And I said, yeah, that's fine, but we absolutely need to find a tool that's going to allow us to kind of like, you know, bump up the quality that we present on tour, even though we are on, you know, economically uh, a tight kind of ship and tight budget. And that's when I was very lucky to kind of meet Francis and uh, our friends at Busho in Alabama actually uh, did us a full on presentation. Uh, of SMOD. Now, to me, SMOD, uh, it was very interesting because for me, SMOD isn't just, and it isn't just a media server. Uh, to me, SMOD is end to end. Uh, and it actually replaces a lot of machines for me because not only is it my work environment when I'm at home with my own SMOD station, 
But on top of that, it becomes my VFX console. So on television, I would have used, uh, in English, a VFX operator with its own console that would actually treat all the live image in real time. Uh, and then on the other side, I would have all my uh, operators on the media service. Now, the thing is, on tour, I couldn't obviously have my VFX operators. And um, my uh, friends that were operators, obviously, on the media servers uh, were using tools that I personally was finding not difficult to understand, but would find limiting quite quickly because everything would take, A, too much time, uh, and we, we would kind of bump against the edges of the ability of those solutions very quickly. So I see SMOD, and SMOD allows me to treat my real-time live feed of cameras very easily. Uh, on the other hand, it allows me to actually work much before my pre-production to assemble my show fast. And then on top of that, when you've got, you know, really good operators, I mean, I've been really lucky. I've, I, I know I've been working with Matteo Butice. Uh, I've worked with... Many of them are actually with us today. In is he? Ah, yeah, great, great. Yeah. Matteo is here. Uh, Loic uh, is here. I've worked with a lot of these guys, and you know, like eh, your oh, wow. operator is basically your savior, and uh, it's uh, it's it's very very important to me that you know the teams kind of like are all involved in the creative process as well. Um, so suddenly, I've got this solution, and we're off on tour, and uh, we do stars of the eighties, but this time on tour with Smart, and suddenly an awful lot of things become possible that were not possible before for us. And again, I talk about budget because I think it's important today, you know, when we kind of talk about any project we work on, you know, it's no good being creative and artistic if basically you can't afford your ideas. And one of the amazing things is, you know, with Smart, I afford whatever I want. I can do whatever I want pretty much. Uh, so this uh, piece of content you're seeing is basically uh, stars of the 80s, this time at the Paris La Défense Arena. And uh, this time we were running with Smart. Now, I want to tell you this little kind of like anecdote because I think it's quite an interesting one. Um, we made a mistake on our side of things and uh, we've been touring with this same show, albeit a little bit smaller in smaller zenits. We've been touring with this show already for like two months. So the whole show was encoded. The show was ready to go. No problem. And it was basically full on time coded and everything. And we turn up at uh, the arena Paris La Défense and suddenly Matteo uh, says to me, Chris, the smart is empty. And we're like, we to this day, you know, we made a mistake, but we don't know exactly where. But we basically got the wrong machine sent to us. And there was absolutely no time left to kind of get the, the new machines because we didn't know where they were. So in 48 hours, <laughs> Matteo and myself, well, myself, very little. I was just kind of bringing the coffee every half an hour. But uh, for 48 hours... Matteo managed to kind of reprogram, re-encode, in-time code, everything as it was and better, uh, the full show. And that show was live on television uh, on France Television 48 hours after we started. So uh, I think that shows that you know, there's not a lot of machines. Uh, there's not a lot of setups, environments that actually allow you that quickly uh, to work and to do this kind of stuff. Now, a lot of these things are not... Uh, rendered, you know, real time. A lot of these things are actually different assembly of media, uh, which are actually overlaid and kind of treated and stuff like that. But I do want to say, like, this is a big deal, even though not a lot is, you know, generated in real time. Um, this normally would actually create immense problems. The second we would have one media, another one overlaid in screen modes. And then suddenly I want to add some particles and add some kind of kaleidoscope effect to the particles, but not to the media behind. Very quickly, my servers normally would actually start struggling. And in this situation, as long as you use A, the right, obviously, files, uh, HAP, my God, at the beginning, I never wanted to use it. And now I never want to use anything else. Um, but it's like, as long as you treat the machine as you, you need to, and as long as you basically, you know, take care in terms of what you feed into SMOD, it pretty much never lets me down. So that's one of the big, big things. Um, I know you guys at home obviously want to kind of like see SMOD in action a bit more. 
And uh, for example, I just wanted uh, wanted if Basil could actually show a little bit of the video of uh, J'aime regarder les filles. Uh, I don't know if you that one. Yeah. So in that one, I mean, obviously, we're, there's a lot of close-ups and stuff like that, but um, this was quite a, a cool thing for us. Uh, at the time, we were working with uh, our mates, our friends at Cutback in Paris, uh, and uh, we were working as well with uh, Matteo as an operator. Um, these teams, we kind of work together all the time, if I'm completely honest, you know, we're all mates and stuff, and, you know, it's... It's a really cool environment to work in. Now, one thing I really wanted was, this artist is very static. He's got his guitar, he's at his microphone, and he doesn't move. So obviously the first thing was to kind of get a few dancers kind of like, you know, <laughs> moving around him. But the next thing was, most of our sets is LED screen. So something needs to happen that makes this interesting. And we started working on the idea of just basically giving it a bit of a 70s look. Uh, so obviously starting to work on kind of like warm colors, oranges and reds and stuff like that. But the other thing is, even though he's static as an artist, I didn't want him to look static. I still wanted him to be dynamic. And um, between Cutback and Matteo, they've managed to kind of like create a, a, a media that actually animates uh, the camera fluxes and keeps them moving. Uh, on top of that, they apply kind of various masks and stuff like that. And I think we can see that we've got the compo uh, on uh, the SMOD at the moment. Basil, can I go on it? Yeah, thank you. So basically, uh, we've got the compo here. So this is the compo that was created by Matteo. Maybe Matteo can tell us if he's happy for us to share this so everyone can actually uh, watch the compo. Yes, so Matteo is looking at the live. So Matteo, you can let us know. And if it's OK to share this, we will put it in a zip file on, on the Smart Academy website. That would be amazing. He's a legend anyway. Uh, so, uh, okay. as you can see, we've got uh, two fluxes here. And uh, already, you know, that's part of what I wanted to talk to you guys about is the fact that, you know, you've got this flux, for example, here, that actually is uh, the entry from the camera. Um, obviously, they're not linked at the moment. So, uh, But um, we treat immediately our image because it, before it actually goes to other compos. So we actually turn it black and white, then we actually start colorizing it a little bit, and then it starts moving on through the different kind of uh, compos we've got below, which actually give us the various animations. So I think it's in play, yeah. So as you can see on this, basically everything's generated. So that's just a bit of fun for us. Uh, but the image is actually constantly transferred from one screen to the next, and it actually appears within masks. So if I actually go, let me find one where I've got my video. Maybe this one. Yeah. So basically, this one actually has our video in it. And the idea is basically that with a very static uh, video, you actually manage just through basic animation, uh, basic kind of masks, uh, and your normal live feed, you manage to make it look quite fun, quite cool, even though he's literally not moving at all, which is what we love. Basil, help me out. How do yeah, I... Can, can I try to play a bit, please? Go on. Cut. Could I try to play a bit with the, because I see there is a timeline, so I want to see yeah, what's course. happening. Uh, so these are all our sequences. And I think some of them use the video feed and some yeah, don't. Exactly, yeah. And uh, yeah, so typically the idea is that the video feed is like a layer, like any other layer, and it's very um, easy to incorporate the video in non-trivial ways put them on 3D objects and integrate them really in the, the compositing. And Absolutely. now what we can see is, is working with a placeholder video, uh, but the idea is to use Charette Compose, and then you can very easily switch from the, uh, the placeholder video to the actual live feed. So what's really cool about this is that not only does our image get treated easily, quickly, 
On top of that, we've got these animations, but all this obviously can be done before before we turn up and would like switch on on the day, basically the pipes to the camera. Uh, so it's nice and easy, but there is no surprise uh, when we turn up kind of thing. Um, so I just like to kind of show you this because this illustrates perfectly um, what we're after in SMOD. It's the fact that it's generative. It's the fact that on top of that, we take any kind of input and play with it. Uh, and quite literally, you know, you're in control creatively. But I, I, I don't find myself anymore assembling as I turn up on the day. The show pretty much happens um, because everything is actually created beforehand and uh, there are no surprises, basically. So, Great. is there any questions for the moment? Uh, I see no really questions. All uh, our uh, top smart encoders are online watching us. Uh, Anthony uh, just joined us also. Uh, and by the way, since you were talking about Paris La Défense Arena, yes. uh, I remind you that we made a special topic on this with uh, yeah. our guest Anthony Toraldo last week, and you can rewatch it on the Smart Academy website. Excellent. Excellent. The first version of this compo was worked on by Anthony Toraldo. Here you go. Matteo is getting us straight. <laughs> oh. Um, so, okay, so, one of the big things that um, I think people don't always uh, realize, and I think that's uh, for you as a creator as well, you know, like uh, Francis, is the fact that your tools uh, aren't always just used for what you intended them to be. And I think that's one of the cool things. Um, one of the things we've uh, I've come to kind of find with um, Smart is that I use it pretty much from the moment I've got an idea, and uh, I use it as well in pitches. Now I know this might not be uh, immediately usable by everyone, but I think if some of you watching uh, want to pitch ideas to kind of clients or pitch ideas for like you know a little stage setup or kind of like you know get involved in the creative process. Uh, more than you know, operating smart. I think smart is a great tool to do that. Uh, my uh, the thing we found is that before, when I had an idea for a stage or a set, I needed to basically wait for the stage designer uh, to kind of go through the architect, send us through the AutoCAD, and kind of like you know, it, it would take quite a long time to kind of go through the iterations. And you know that today the speed of iteration is gigantic. You need to go fast. And you need to, you know, your exception yeah. to speak very quickly. So, as I was saying, one of the uh, interesting uh, secondary uses I found for SMOD, and that's been very useful, is the fact that we can very, very quickly prototype a stage setup or a set. Now, I kind of thought it would be fun if today, you know, in uh, maybe 10, 15 minutes, uh, we could give it a go, if Francis is up for it, uh, in prototyping very roughly. A dancing with the stars set. What do you think? Uh, I think I'm uh, quite stressed because I'm really not an operator and I really respect the encoders because they do an, an incredible job. But since it is you, Chris, I will try to do it for you. Alrighty. I've done a step by step kind of like uh, thing. So ideally, it would be great if uh, we managed to do this in 10 minutes just to prove okay. that basically it's that easy. You ready? Uh, it's a lot of stress. Yeah. But let's say I'm ready. Everyone is watching you now. Okay, let's start. So, all right. So, Francis, first thing we're going to create is uh -huh. the dance floor, and that's going to be just an LED uh, uh, projection. So, just a planar surface, uh, twelve meters by sixteen meters. Okay. Uh, let's do oh. ten meters. Let's say 10 meters by 16 meters, actually. 10 meters by 16 meters. OK, so maybe we can choose a resolution for this. Uh, let's say 200 pixels per meter. So 10 by 16 okay. will be that resolution it's for the be, It's going to be a projection. Yes, a projection. Perfect. So let's proceed. I'm creating the project. And this one will be the floor. And also, we will link this to a test pattern in order to be able to testing very quickly what we are doing. 
and I'm going since it's video projection, I'm going to create an element, a surface that goes onto the floor, which is on the floor and whose size is 10 by 16 meters. This is our floor. Now, oh, if I need perfect. projection on this, I still need to create a video projector. So give yes. me a second. Uh, which video projector do we have, Chris? We normally use, uh, well, we normally use several, but I think if we go for a uh, 30,000 lumen, that would be good. Okay, so let's go for a 35,000 lumen. So I need to move this projector a bit. Uh, I think minus 90 would be great. And it has to be above us. Drag and drops are a bit difficult on the uh, online server. Sorry about that. It's I'm gonna really... answer. I'm gonna answer a small question from Roma. Uh, yes. He's asking if we render some videos before the shows or if uh, everything is always in real time. Honestly, uh, we have real mixed media, as you can see. Uh, the one we just showed you before was basically fully. It was a generative plus on top of that uh, treatment in real time of the camera influxes. Uh, but we do have as well. Uh, I would say a good 50% of uh, medias that are actually, you know, pre-encoded and pre-rendered. Okay, so I think I have the floor with the 4K projector, 35K uh, uh, projector. We move on now. Step two, we're going to create four little steps, which are obviously okay. at uh, the bottom of the floor over there. And uh, these steps are actually 25 centimeters high. Uh, by 50 centimeters deep, but these are actually going to be LED steps, and we're only going to okay. have LED on the front of the step, not on top. Okay, so let's uh, maybe we first need to create a content map for this. So there will be four uh, steps, right, uh, and 12 meters large, and which is the pitch uh, of those? We're on, we're on 10. Okay. 10. So uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, that will be a good resolution. I'm so going to ask another question. Nothing. Yes. Uh, which is for the French TV show. Uh, they are using uh, three barcodes, 40K. Uh, you are right. Uh, these specs are actually changing all the time on the French TV show. Uh, we started out with 320Ks, and uh, little by little every year, they actually just uh, you know add on to each other. Uh, but in this exercise, we're trying to show that very quickly we can render uh, basically the sets quite easily. So I'm now creating the stair. The size uh, is correct, I believe. Yes, here it is. Uh, it took the pitch from the resolution. Uh, so this is my first stair. Uh, let's call it stair one. Uh, I make four of them. Uh, each needs to be over 25 meters above one other. Uh, also, uh, the stairs we see front faces and not the top face, so I think we need to orient them. Uh, let's do this on the floor simultaneously. And also, they are not at the same depth, uh, so half a meter depth, we say it. Francis, you're a star. Oh, no. You're doing okay. great. <laughs> I'm a very bad encoder because I'm stressing a lot, you know. And good encoders, I never stress, which is not my case at all. Uh, we need to move uh, this uh, choice of content maps. This one goes to three, this one goes to two, this one goes to one. And hopefully we can see appearing the test pattern for the stairs. What's yep. the next step, Chris? Perfect. The next one, uh, actually what we'll do is we'll immediately create the stage that goes obviously behind the fourth step. So uh, can you create an LED screen? Again, guys, I'm taking just some just liberties with the real specs of the set because the set actually changes all the time. So I'm basically very quickly uh, just simplifying the set itself, okay? Uh, we're going to create another planner LED screen. That's basically the floor uh, that goes from the last step. 
This one is going to be uh, 12 meters wide, and we're going to give it a depth of about three meters. And uh, again, we're going to stay with a pitch of 10. Okay, so I just created a content map for this, and now I'm going to create the LED uh, plane. So this is again the planar. Uh, we connect it to the second level. Here is our second level. Uh, so maybe I can get some more room working. Is that bad, Basile? Okay, sorry, I was interrupted by Basil uh, quickly, um, and I'm just positioning a bit by hand. Is that okay, Chris, or should I be more precise no, on this? It's fine. Uh, I it's think we can put, yeah, replace yeah. by the exact value uh, we, by doing this, and I think this is about what we need to have. Yeah, that's right. Makes sense. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Okay, next step. Uh, we're going to basically, uh, so we're going to now create the screens at the very, very top of the stage. So uh, on the front version of the stars, we've got one big circle, uh, but we've got, you know, one big circle at the center and we've got two rings on the outer side. And um, actually we're discussing that with Francis. One of the smart way to do this is to actually create one single um, Plan an LED screen that basically you know spans the full 10 meter width that we're going to want, and then just play with content maps to create you know the mass areas of the two rings and the actual circle. That only works obviously if you've got exactly the same pixel uh, all over. Uh, on the French version of the show, uh, we have different values of pixels for the center area uh, and the two outer rings. In this situation, we just basically assume that everything is the same uh, pixel value, pitch value. So it's going to go again. 10 millimeter pitch. Okay, perfect. So let's call this one back screens. I'm going to put the name here also. Back screens. So they need to be rotated 90 degrees. Uh, they need to be pushed in the back of the stage. We can uh, push so them a good way behind. Yeah, yeah. You can keep going. Keep going. Go, go, go. Go, go, go. I should do only very small steps due to the That's... cloud view. And uh, this needs to be higher, I guess. Um, Not too much, like... because we want uh, the center to be, the center needs to be about probably like um, four meters off the ground. We're never going to see the full outer ring uh, circle, if that makes sense. Okay, so that's the uh, bounding box of it. Uh, yeah. I just made a rectangle for now. Yeah. And now we are going to reproduce the shape, the actual shape of the screen. And in order to do this, uh, first I'm going to put some white onto this. Then I'm going into my content map and show something we have not done yet, but which is very easy to do, which is to apply modifiers inside uh, the content map. And in this case, I'm going to use a circle mask, uh, put myself with pixels. And I think the size should be maybe 500. Uh, mask, mask. But for this technique to work, it's very important to have an alpha layer. Otherwise, it won't work properly. And also, uh, whoops, uh, let's put some contents into this stage. So for the moment, I will be using an ISF shader as usual, uh, because that's very easy to do. Send this on the back, play. Go back to the content map, uh, the content map, back screens, set up this circle. So 1000 pixels is the size of the whole overall thing. And now if we go back to the stage, we can see that our screen has the requested size. And we can now uh, continue using some other maps. So for example, another screen, 800 pixels, and this one will be in subtract mode uh, and let's do another screen 600 pixels this one will be in additive mode again remove 
and the last one for the inner. So it's not exactly the same one, but let's take the liberty. No. And now we have this back screen. Is it fine for the height of the screen? Yeah, I think uh, that. Uh, let me just check the reference. Just a touch lower. Be. Like this, maybe? Lower. Lower, OK. Yeah. Like this. That's it. Yeah, you got it. OK, perfect. So maybe we can put some more content into this stage, or do we, what do we need next? Uh, so the next thing we need to kind of move on to. So on the um, so we've actually created uh, the screen at the end. Let's try to create now uh, the LED strips that are actually on the left and right of the stage. Now look, in real life, we've got a mix of uh, star pipes. Uh, and uh, LED screens. In this situation, I think that for the purpose of just rendering easily, all we need to do, and I think that uh, that's your preferred option, Francis, is to create yeah. a rectangular, rectangular LED screen to the left of the stage. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna basically use masks to create the various sizes of arcs of circle uh, that okay. we need. So just to be sure, we are talking about exactly. those screens you can see here in the sides. So okay, let's create those as rectangulars. So I, I'm going to join both of them in the same content map because it's the same pitch and it's like symmetrical. So let's create another content map. Uh, you have any idea of the size, please, Chris? These ones are actually uh, something like four meters tall, if I don't make a mistake. Uh, four meters tall, and I think the area is no more than like four meters wide. Okay, so let's say four by four. So I need uh, in my uh, resolution um, 100 pixels if it's still the same pitch. So, and since I'm going to put the two of them in the same content map, uh, I'm going to use this resolution. And how do you call those screens? Side LEDs? Those to me are, we just call them, the, I call them the star pipes, even though they're not really. Star pipes? Yeah, star like pipes. That. Okay, let's say like this. And we need to split this content map horizontally in two pieces. To have the left and the right, uh, we can just keep it calling one and two. And let's now create them into the stage. Uh, so again, it's an LED screen. We connect the first one to the first star pipe. The pitch is 10 millimeters. The size was computed automatically. We need to rotate it. And we need to make it higher and move it on the side. Keep going. It's above the stairs, huh? Yeah, it's above the stairs, absolutely. It's on level with the flats. Yeah, that's it, above, yeah, that's it. So now I'm going really fast to get the overall idea. Uh, of course, things could be made a bit more precise. Uh, you can move them, you can move them, move it to the back of that uh, setup. So basically move those three meters back. Like this, you mean? That's it. And you can actually open them up another five meters sideways. Uh, you mean larger? Not larger, they physically uh, move sideways. Yeah, making this farther away. Uh, yeah, that's like it. This thing is. A bit more? So, like minus 10 and that's plus it. 10. And this one needs to go to the second part of the content. I'm just going to add another renderer uh, for this star pipe ADs, and then we can remove the test pattern. Okay. Maybe before going further, Chris, we need a global camera mapping, no? What do you think? Let's do it. Okay, perfect. So for this, I'm going into the stage, creating a camera. Uh, so this camera uh, should be farther. Um, it should probably, so the best is simply to have a look inside the camera. What do we see? So this is the camera mapping. I usually call this one CanApp. Um, so that's what our camera mapping sees. Uh, do you like? The, let's leave the camera. Yeah, a little bit. That's right. Yeah, 
that's from the crane point of view, which is good. And uh, let's move it sideways uh, to the right by maybe like three meters, if possible. Oh, this one is really for sending content, and then we can create another viewpoint if you want. Okay. To, uh, let's maybe keep this one just to create a camera mapping, and then we can very easily send content into the this scheme. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, we will do the lesson on this. We still have not done it, but basically, I create a 3D camera mapping connected to the camera called CamApp, uh, give it some resolution. So I think in this case, we could say uh, 1000 times 2000, for example. I select the target of the camera mapping. So in this case, I want to send on everybody. Um, oops. Uh, so this is my new canvas. Now, uh, instead of all the previous renderers, I'm going to take another layer and send it inside the camera mapping. Uh, like, for example, uh, I'm not sure what this one is doing, but let's try this. Okay, some balls. And normally, they are projected onto the stage. And we can move around to see what's happening. OK, um, let me add these two in additive. Yes, Chris, what's next? All right. Do you want to actually split uh, the content already in those uh, side screens because they need to be arc circles? Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, I, I forgot this. Uh, sorry. Uh, so let's go doing this uh, the start pipe LEDs. So we are go first going to work on the uh, left side. And again, yeah. we are going to use some circle masks. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to use pixels. And uh, I need to make it larger. So Uh, let me check the image quickly. I ah, yeah, there's uh, rather big circles like this. Yeah. Important that we don't see the edge of the screen. Yeah. Uh, we should exclude the edge. Okay. Yeah. So we can start like this, and this one needs to be removed. Uh, okay. Let's put another in add. Um, oh, I have a, a doubt now. I think uh, we should better work on the whole uh, like this. Um, yes, that will be better. So these are my circles. The first, the and we want them. Uh, so not so easy, Chris. You're doing great. We nearly there. Yeah. Okay. We nearly uh, it's not going to be 10 minutes, but we're nearly there. OK, OK. Same trick, add, remove. And now we can create our bounce quickly. This can be thin. Yeah. Maybe I can even group those. Yeah. And directly duplicate. Does that work? Oh, the group has no plasmas. Too bad. So that's really quickly made, huh? But and. Um, I'm really enjoying your demo, Francis. <laughs> yes, we do. I'm enjoying it less. <laughs> uh, those masks are a bit messy to configure, but it should be fine. Let's move this like this. Uh, what I am missing? Um, oh, maybe I, uh, I need to put everything like this. It's a bit tricky. I think I should better create a layer mask uh, in this case. Uh, let's, for example, I, I think there is a more smart way. Um, function mask, probably. 
Uh, so let's try with the function mask uh, with a linear mask inside and a kaleidoscope. Uh, let's try something crazy. So circular FX mask, this one. What's this? So the function mask, we not often show it, but it enables to apply a function on top of um, a given mask. And I'm going to use a noise function uh, yeah. and I'm going to increase the contrast of this function in order to create some bars. And oh, Perfect. what's happening there? That's nice, no? Perfect. Okay, that was easier. Uh, always think generative. <laughs> <laughs> and now we can like play a bit with the shape of this yeah. and also uh, what we can do is like just try different seeds uh, which will create di different combination of circles yeah. to find what's the important never, what's important in this one is never to see the edge of the screen uh, okay. so basically always make sure the screen starts with black so we do feel okay. like it's uh, so probably the best, the easiest to ensure this is to like remove the invert of a circle, for example, and let's increase this. And now we can really right. cut this to ensure we never see. Is it like you want it, uh, yeah. Chris? It's great. Okay, perfect. Uh, so that's our stage so far. Uh, what's next? So we're going to move on now to uh, the totem. So basically, on the on the left and right of the dance floor, uh, at a distance of about probably eight meters, we actually have, you see them as strips, uh, but to simplify them, we're going to do five totems, uh, four totems. These are going to okay. be five meters high, and one meter wide, and they're going to be uh, same thing again, 10 millimeter pitch. pitch. Okay, so let's create them as planar LED screens. Uh, I will first create a first totem. So for this, I need a new content map uh, that will be called totems. Can you remind me the total number of totems? It's uh, the total for the whole set is eight. Eight. Uh, it's four on one side, four on the other. Eight totems and which was the their width again? Sorry, I did not. Their width is one meter each. Okay. And, and the height. Five meters high. Five meters. Okay. So this is my new totems map, and I'm going to split it into eight different totems. Uh, I could first split for the four on the left and four on the right and split each of those into four. So we keep some structure, which is always good to have when coding. And now where is my totem? It is the totem one. And so totem one will take will be on the left side and we take the first zone. So now I'm going really quickly, but uh, when doing this, you can, of course, rename this into left and right, for example, or Cour and Jardin for the French ones. Uh, so here is my first totem. It needs to be rotated 90 degrees. We are going to put the answer uh, maybe so yes, the size is one by five. That's nice. The answer may be, uh, no, that's not I, what I wanted to the five. Yes, that will be easier. It needs to be rotated like this also. And uh, where is it exactly? It's eight meters, uh, you told me. So it is eight. And do you have an eight idea? Eight meters from the edge of the floor. Ah, yes, from the edge, and the floor is 10 wide. Yeah. So, uh, 13, if I'm not wrong. There you go. So, that's correct? Yeah. Okay, so you like the position? The position needs to be aligned with uh, the first bottom stair. The that's first it. bottom stair. That's exactly my zero, actually. So, uh, 
but it's not the position that align it like this with 0, 05 here. Now I just change my anchor point to have this alignment because this line is my zero line actually. Yeah. Chris, uh, what is the next step? I just made a totem and I think we need eight of them. That's right. We need four on one side, four on the other symmetrically. Okay, perfect. So that's my first totem. Let's create a second one and move it its position. So do you know how many meters we have between two of them? They need to be uh, spread across the 16 meters. So I think uh, you're looking at what, four? Uh, 16 meters uh, divided by four, for example. So yeah, maybe five meters. Uh, oh, 16 I think by three will be fine. Yep. Two. And this one will be the same times three. I need to relink them to the right parts inside the contents areas. So this one is number four. Oh, that was number two. Left two, left three. Left four. We can group those four guys together and call them totems left, for example. And thanks to this, we can directly duplicate everything, uh, move it uh, at the other side of the stage. So I think that we need 26, if I'm not wrong. Yes, that sounds good. And also, I'm going to rotate 180 degree. But maybe I think I need this. Up. Yes, here is my totems. Uh, so let's remove the test pattern from the totems. And maybe, oh, it's already included in the camera mapping by default because our camera mapping takes everything. Yeah. And if we want uh, to send some contents, we can just add another renderer and send this one on the totems. Yes. So what do you know be great? We're nearly there. It's really good. OK. Be great is if we could actually, um, I've given you the logo of Dancing with the Stars. Yes. Somewhere. Uh, Yes, uh, I, I do have it here. Um, it's the prototype challenge, yeah. Yes, this one. Okay. Yeah. So that one. Yes. Be great. So maybe I have a HAP version of this one. Let me check uh, this one. Oh, yes. Okay, well, so where do you want to have this? Uh, we should go into the circle screen and we should see mostly, uh, we should see it mostly in the actual center circle. Okay, so let's get a bit closer to this in order to see how it is scaled and now we can simply change the scale factor here. Uh, we may be will be adding a black uh, background just to see exactly what's happening there. And the black goes into the back screen, and now we have our video. So, do you like it like this? Oh, let's make it a touch bigger. I think okay. it can take it. That's it. Great. Great. Like, okay. Perfect. A bit bigger. A bit bigger. So it actually touches the third, the second um, ring as well. That's it. Yeah, that's great. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, so and maybe you need a preview of um, a simulation processor, I mean, a previous processor. In order to have a nice looking preview of this. Perfect. So we are going to use the stage preview. We are going to link um, uh, the current camera to our camera mapping point of view. Or maybe we need to make a dedicated camera that would be easier more flexible so that's the current uh, i think we need some more content so do you have any preference for the content you know what would be great is uh can we actually put the logo in uh, ads 
uh, behind the logo, can we actually just uh, create some generative kind of like uh, flat color, you know, like let's say just some, uh, I don't know, just bright pink or bright or just white that actually goes across all the content and comes back. Okay, so let me show you some really cool feature, which is the volume layer. Uh, so uh, the volume layer basically is a 3D uh, object that is being sent onto the stage. So here in this case, it's a sphere. And I think if we check those targets, it's going to send content on all the surfaces and LED screens that we have made so far. So let's go in the simulation mode. Yeah, that's what we have. And now the great thing is this sphere, we can really move it into the 3D space directly. So maybe I'm going into my stage preview. That's the previous processor. Let's finish this quickly. Uh, green arrow, not that, sorry. Yes. Uh, oh, I think in the volume layer, I need to uncheck display volume. Yes, that's what I was looking for. So now, basically, I have a sphere that we can move inside our stage. So the video should be in additive mode, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And now we can move our screen. Actually, the video should be on uh, add, I think. On uh, what? Screen. screen, sorry. Ah, yes, in screen mode. OK, perfect. So let me just check something here. The back screens are there. And the video, we are going to put it in screen mode. This one. And now we can just play with this 3D sphere. Uh, 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 the black background that you actually added is between the sphere and the actual logo. Oh, you are right. Thank you, Chris. Exactly. That was the issue. Uh, and now this sphere, so we could put some uh, color into it if we want. Uh, like, yeah. for example, let's use a gradient and put some. Which color would you like to have? We'll go for a uh, pink, magenta, you know? Uh huh. Like this, for example. Well, yeah, you can go for that. Okay, let's try this one. And I think also we could play with the alpha to let it disappear smoothly. Yeah. And now I think if we let's try the radius of the sphere, see what happens. What do you think of this? That is great. How do you animate that for the previous? Uh, if we want a really fast way, we just create a back and forth loop and tell it to go so from zero to maybe 20 meters, let's say. And we can directly access the shape uh and the speed of this animation quicker much quicker let's go on random uh with a random shape sure yeah. also we could link it to the sound if you if you want to the <laughs> energy of the audio signal That's genius well i think that uh we might because it's a previous as to present uh, let's go for something uh, just more soft, softer. So like you yeah. had it at the beginning. Sorry, I went into the techno. Uh, <laughs> uh, so where is my content again? Sorry, content. And let's go for something more soft. Uh, so the number of repetitions would be one. And I think Sinus was great, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think if we want to make it softer, we can still play a bit with uh, the exact alpha layers we have here. Yeah. So instead of the triton, we could use a quadritone, and yeah. then we get some more control over the exact shape. Can uh, we make sure it never goes to zero and uh, yeah, that it okay. reaches 70 in uh, its max? Seven meters, you mean, Max? No, sorry, I mean the. Um, uh, I think that in the phase, does it actually go to 100% or not on this? Um, you, you're talking about the size of, or uh, of about what? Sorry, exactly. The intensity of the color. Yes. Oh, no, we, we are not at the maximum. Let me show you. This is the current gradient. Hmm. Uh, so we could go uh, more. Uh, 
You want something more bright? Yeah. Great. Okay. There you go. Well, uh, that's done, huh? I mean, well, really, uh, we... so I mean, I know it kind of like obviously uh, took a little bit longer than uh, we wanted, but you know what? This normally would require about a week between the time yeah. to actually make the sketches no, and the not time so to get a little bit yeah. So this is actually plenty to now go and present to a client and say, look, I've had this idea. This is kind of how it would work. What do you think? And you don't actually waste any more time and uh, you know in terms of iterating uh once you actually yeah. have something good then you can actually de develop from there straight away and um that's it really yeah i just added some uh, funny colors uh using the polar coordinates modifier uh, on top of the isf shader but uh, that was just for fun uh so <laughs> i hope you enjoyed this uh do you want me to add anything else chris um, look, no, just, you know, honestly, I love SMOD. I hope that uh, what I said today made sense to everyone. If it doesn't, you know, honestly, don't hesitate to ask. And, um, you know, yeah, keep doing what you're doing, guys. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you very much for being with us today, Chris, and sharing all the things you shared with us uh, today. It was really interesting and it's really good to also see like the actual results and the big shows because not everybody is aware of all the crazy things we do with SMAD and thank you for helping showing this. Always a pleasure. Thank you. So last thing is to tell you what's next. So we continue the SMAD Academy next week and Monday we will have another guest which is uh, Martin Hans and uh, he is a former developer of SMAD but he's also a very um, a creative visual artist and he will show us some of the creative techniques that he has developed with SMOD. So enjoy your weekend and see you next week on SMOD Academy. Bye. Bye. Bye.